Yeah. Go ahead, okay. Cindy. Okay. Give me a minute here. Uh, I'm fresh off of lecture. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So I apologize. Those of you who were at the, these whirlwind talks last year, these are lightly updated from last year. So, so pretty much a repeat. Um, I wanted to just give, especially the new students and maybe newer, uh, you know, postdocs or faculty to our groups, just a, a brief whirlwind tour of some of the projects that, that I'm, I'm leading. You know, I, I am involved in a lot of collaborative work, but I have some, some projects that I try to take the lead on as well. And so the two projects I wanted to highlight in, partic in particular, because they really focus on stats methods development, are the, the projects for, for sensors in environmental epi studies and also uh, a project that I've been working on since I joined this group as a postdoc with exhaled nitric oxide. And of course, uh, this is not in, in uh, uh, I'm not doing this by myself, there's huge teams behind all these projects. I wanted to recognize everyone there as well. So to motivate, first of all, the sensor project, I just wanted to take us back in time to when people first started studying air pollution health effects and you know, think about the types of data that had been used in the past. And so time series studies were uh, one of the classical study designs and back in, in London in 1952 during that dramatic air pollution event for the great smog. I guess we're having a great smog right now ourselves. Yes, we are. <laughs> it's smoky here. Uh, but, you know, there was, you really didn't need fancy statistical methods. You know, there was a period where you could see that the air pollution just had a big spike. And unfortunately, deaths had a great big spike too, looking at daily death counts. And so it became really obvious that there was a, a big uh, association between uh, air pollution and deaths. Uh, and nowadays, at least back in the day, nowadays it used to be more subtle. Um, we'll see how things are now. Um, but you know, we used to look at time series studies, um, trying to pick out the more subtle relationships between air pollution, day-to-day -day changes in air pollution, and day-to-day -day changes, for example, in, in mortality counts. Uh, here at the here at USC, one of our great strengths has been the Southern California Children's Health Study. And this study design was a, a cohort study where we would follow. Uh, various cohorts uh, longitudinally over time, approximately annual assessments. And so you can start to see how these types of data are structured in sort of a time series study or a cohort study. And one of the, the newer technologies that I think is very interesting in terms of statistical methods and is the idea of having a wearable sensor where we're now, uh, here's, here's some data that, that Rima Haber select, uh, collected with one of her field team members. Uh, this person was at the Soto building uh, and then they, they wore a, a wearable, or they had an air pollution monitor in their car uh, next to them uh, on a seat. And then they also were wearing a heart rate monitor. And so you can imagine how with these types of data, you can look, you know, minute by minute or even second by second at air pollution and be relating this to a health outcome like heart rate. And so now this is an incredibly finely uh, time resolved exposure and potentially even health outcome. Uh, that allows us to ask and answer uh, different sorts of questions and we'll need different methodologies for these. Uh, and then this is, this. I was adopting these slides from a year ago. So here's what the air quality looks like using purple air last year. And here it is this year, <laughs> yesterday. This is yesterday. So it wasn't quite as bad as it's been, but um, you know, now we have these networks of cheap stationary sensors. So they give us a lot more spatial resolution. They're noisy, uh, they're not calibrated. Uh, in the same way that more uh, uh, more gold standard uh, research grade equipment are, but this this opens up a lot of opportunities uh, as well. So so this project I'm talking about right now, Prisms, it was an NIBIB funded project that actually ended about two weeks ago. So I'm trying to think about sort of next steps now. Um, but this is a really large uh, group of of projects. Uh, there was a data coordinating center here at USC and also an informatics platform and a number of sensor development uh, projects as well. The overall goal of this project was to to develop tools for epidemiological studies that would incorporate uh, wearable sensors or, or you know, stationary sensors. And so just, just to give you a sense of the types of studies that could be used, that could be using these kinds of um, uh, sensors, uh, in the UCLA USC group, they proposed a prospective panel study with uh, about 40 people who were followed very intensively for two weeks where people were actually wearing monitors, wearing a smartwatch, uh, having to charge these devices, uh, you know, nightly, very intensive, a lot of really rich data. Uh, uh, the Utah group took a, a complementary approach where they put just a sensor inside somebody's home and a sensor outside somebody's home and had daily questionnaires. So it was a lot uh, uh, less burdensome, so they were able to do it for a longer period of time, but the data wasn't quite as personal, uh, wasn't quite as rich. Um, but the longer duration let you maybe catch some more rare uh, types of outcomes. 
Uh, and so here is a fun graphic that I just had developed for our, our PRISM project group to talk about uh, some of the statistical methods development we did. And so uh, the basic idea of the group that we were working on the stats methods development is we wanted to take uh, this really rich stream of data and figure out uh, some new methods that would help us answer new questions and address some of the challenges in these data. So I wanted to just highlight uh, a couple projects uh, and so Charlotte Deng, who recently graduated, she worked on uh, a longitudinal machine learning approach where she basically uh, melded together a simple decision tree along with a random effect style model to allow for different baselines for each person, but to allow for the flexibility of a, a decision tree and sort of the simplicity of interpretation of a decision tree. Uh, and then uh, Keenan uh, Lee uh, developed uh, this idea about how can we look at time series data that's very rich uh, and where there's, let's, let's say you're in an activity classification problem where you see that there's clearly, like if, if you see here, there's clearly a different pattern in the time series signal uh, that is here and then there's a different pattern here and so on. And most of the algorithms for processing these data use just a rolling average window of a fixed uh, time or of, of a fixed width. And so Keenan developed a way to do a smart size window using 3D and Gaussian, 3D Gaussian segmentation um, so they could use these better, better data processing and, and actually making the windows appropriate for the, for the duration of each activity. Uh, and then Keenan also developed ways to think about um, taking very rich exposure time series and summarizing the diurnal pattern, the typical diurnal pattern. Uh, so he, used a, he did a novel implementation of self-organizing maps to think about summarizing these daily patterns in exposure. Uh, and then Charlotte Deng took a, a complementary approach. Instead of thinking about a diurnal pattern impacting health, she thought, what happens if there's a very short pattern, like a, a big spike, for example, pattern? How could we identify these shapes of exposures that could impact health? So she was looking at uh, identifying these transient patterns in time series uh, using a shapelets method. Uh, and then finally, Shane, uh, has been working on thinking about moving beyond uh, a modeling kind of binary asthma status uh, using sort of transition models or traditional sort of logistic regression mixed effects models and thinking about rather modeling uh, sort of the multi-day exacerbations and sort of time to recovery and exacerbations as well. And so this, this is just sort of my old version of that slide before I got the cool figure. And so then, then to transition on to another topic which is near and dear to my heart is exhaled nitric oxide. And so I, I was thinking about sort of the themes for this talk and sensors are a, a new way of sort of doing very detailed uh, measurements, either personal or sort of in different spatial areas of, of exposures and potentially even health outcomes. And FENO is a way to, it's an exhaled breath biomarker where you can get a really detailed understanding of uh, what's going on in terms of inflammation in your respiratory system in, in a non-invasive way. And so, so exhaled nitric oxide is, is measured at the mouth. It's the concentration of nitric oxide. And when you have higher levels, this is thought to be related to, to high, more inflamed tissue. Uh, there's a standardized way of assessing it. Uh, it's been measured in the Children's Health Study. Uh, an amazing effort was done uh, in the later years of the most recent cohort to measure a huge amount of FENO data. There's been some very interesting findings uh, in the Children's Health Study. Uh, one of the reasons why I got so excited about it statistically is because uh, when you breathe out at different flow rates, uh, FENO is highly related to flow. So when you breathe out slowly, concentrations are higher, but when you breathe out fast, concentrations are lower. And so the respiratory physiology community realized, well, they saw this early on in the 90s with this biomarker, and they realized that the reason for this is that there's actually a source of NO both in the airway and in the alveolar region. And so they, they developed some mathematical models to describe those sources of NO. Uh, and so we can overlay the, the stochastically observed data with the deterministic models, and we can actually estimate parameters that, that talk about inflammation in the, the alveolar region versus in the airway wall. Um, and so this gives us a really interesting opportunity to, if we're, if we're interested in air pollution epi, we can study uh, in a very non-invasive way with just FENO measured at the mouse, we can study the effect, impacts of exposures on the more uh, distal, the more proximal parts of the lung using some interesting mathematical statistical modeling. Uh, and so here's, here's the basic idea of that. You take the, the raw tracing of FENO, uh, NO uh, flow rate versus time. We summarize that into these repeated maneuvers for each person. Essentially what we're doing is just fitting a nonlinear 
model for each person. And then uh, we're doing that uh, such that the parameters we're estimating have these biological meanings. Uh, and then one of the projects that is being actively worked on right now by Jingying Wang is trying to figure out some hierarchical Bayesian models to, to not only estimate these NO parameters for each person pooling across all the people in the data set, but also estimate the effects of an exposure on these, uh, on these NO parameters as well. So here's just a really broad overview of a lot of the projects that have been going on uh, there uh, in, in FENO. And some of the projects that are actively in progress are thinking about uh, better ways to, to process these raw uh, man maneuver level uh, data, data profiles. And then also some hierarchical Bayesian models, as I mentioned, with, that Jing Yang is working on. And then my final project, I'm, I'm going to go quickly because I want to make sure there's time for everyone. My final project, I just wanted to bring it up um, because I'm trying to recruit a master's student to help me with this. Uh, but I've been working with a, a great group of people. Um, you can see everybody listed down here uh, on projects trying to look at uh, cancer patients and air pollution exposures after diagnosis. Uh, and so, so uh, Miles Coburn and Frank Gilliland were really some of the initial people to start this in Li Walu uh, and, and others. Uh, and so you can see uh, the first uh, type of cancer we started with was lung cancer patients. And we found that uh, those who were diagnosed and they, they lived in an area with uh, less air pollution, they survived longer uh, than those that were living in areas with higher air pollution. So thinking about patients with uh, uh, cancer patients being another susceptible group to the effects of air pollution exposures. So we did the first analyses in lung cancer patients using data from the California Cancer Registry. The next, oh, and this, this was a very high impact uh, publication, the most high impact of anything I've done before. I got interviewed by like 10 different news outlets. And so that was a very interesting experience for me on that. Um, and then Charlotte Thang uh, followed up with an analysis of liver cancer patients again in the California Cancer Registry, uh, finding even nonlinear effects of air pollution as well. Uh, and then so currently we're working on a project in the California Teacher Study. So instead of looking at the, the whole California Cancer Registry, we're looking at the California Teacher Study uh, and now looking at breast cancer patients. Uh, and this is more challenging because breast cancer survival tends to be longer than these other cancers. Uh, and there's some issues with time varying exposures, people potentially moving. So we wanted to look in a, in a cohort study where we had detailed address information to be able to investigate this. So I'm looking for a master's student to help me with these analyses. So I wanted to give a little plug there. So that's, I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Very interesting and quite a rich collection of studies. Um, any questions for Sandy? Well, hearing none, um, Shang Wang, why don't you take over next? Can you see my screen? We can. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to this uh, uh, BIOS guest seminar. It's great to kind of rejoin this group. Um, uh, uh, similar as Sandy, I quickly just modify some of slides that uh, coming from actually last uh, the early this week's uh, uh, workshop of the uh, MAC study. But um, I want to go through with you about the metabolomics, focus on metabolomics projects that uh, my lab is leading towards in these years. So a little bit brief introduction of myself, because I'm not a biostats faculty. I'm actually environmental health faculty right now. Uh, but I have a root history with the biostats division, because uh, I'm also a graduate from our biostats uh, at USC. And so after my post, uh, and before that, I was actually trained by clinical medicine. So I should originally be a physician, but I decided not to go through that track and uh, following more of the statistical and the research track. And uh, later on, after I graduated from the biostats and I moved to the environmental health and I start with my postdoc and uh, be a faculty right now in our environmental health division. Uh, therefore, my, my projects, um, uh, rather than looking for a very general public health, but actually have a more focused and strong uh, component flavor with the disease mechanism linking to uh, various of disease outcomes. So uh, in recent years, I start with this uh, metabolomics uh, research program uh, in the environmental health research. Um, 
why we, uh, this is actually uh, a very hot topic in recent years in many areas of the clinical and uh, uh, epidemiological studies. Uh, basically, the fundamental idea of metabolomics is that it's an analytic approach to analyze uh, a, a wide spectrum of small molecule chemicals that can be found from all our biosamples. That can include the blood samples, tissue samples, and the urine samples, saliva samples, whatever biosamples you can think about. Why it's important? Because the metabolomics is sitting in the downstream of the molecular network regulation. So we know that coming from our fundamental genes and the, from, uh, to the epigenetics gene expressions, and the, uh, later on, those gene expression expressed to be proteins and they can interfere with the metabolites and uh, then play with the metabolic pathways. Those altered metabolic pathways actually can systematically influence a lot of our organ and uh, our body system and relate with various of disease outcomes. So the metabolomics data actually is very complicated because there are a lot of various approaches can be choose to analyze metabolites. There are targeted metabolomics, untargeted metabolomics, and different platform to analyze the metabolomics. That link to the final, like the data, uh, dim uh, data dimension can be varied a lot, and uh, the data interpretation can be also difficult. So uh, what I think for metabolomics right now, how it can be useful for the uh, epidemiological studies or environmental studies, is that it can be applied to study the disease mechanism. Uh, maybe a lot of people have uh, been aware of that, that metabolic pathway. So this is just an example of one well-known uh, TCA cycle metabolic pathways for the energy metabolism. Uh, so you can see like a different uh, metabolites can play into different end and intermediate of this circle of the metabolic pathways, regardless to say there are a lot of other uh, metabolic pathways uh, playing in, uh, in the system. And then another uh, area is that we can use the metabolomic profile to identify susceptible population, and that can play a, a large, a significant role in the future precision medicine and prevention, because we can use those metabolomic signatures to predict um, uh, the risk of the uh, certain disease outcomes, and it can be used to understand the, the drug metabolism uh, for the different drug response uh, in different susceptible population. And also in recent years, it has been extended to use the same metabolomic uh, uh, analytic approach to analyze the environmental chemical exposure, uh, exposure uh, in our internal body, which we call the exposome. So I'll walk through maybe uh, several studies that we are having right now in the environmental health uh, division using this metabolomics approach. Um, there are just many projects uh, may not be able to cover all those, but we, you can see that we have different outcomes from the cardiometabolic outcomes, birth outcomes, asthma outcomes, and the neurodevelopment outcomes as well. So the first is uh, uh, project is our ongoing uh, my K99 and R0 project. So the idea is to looking at the uh, air pollution and the environmental chemical effect on the cardiometabolic function in the adolescent and young adults. So uh, Sandy already gave a great introduction for the children's health study. Uh, in this CHS studies, we have around 200 participants with very detailed uh, measurement of their childhood air pollution exposures, different air pollutants, and the very detailed metabolic outcomes, including, uh, including their body fat and glucose traits. So this is just a summary of the uh, 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 population. Uh, so first is uh, showing you an example how to use the target metabolomics to address our question about the air pollution relationship with the metabolic pathways. So for example, here we use the archive serum samples to look for 64 endogenous metabolites. They are selected based on our prior knowledge about their relationship with diabetes risk in adult population or animal models. So we can use, uh, uh, this is just one example of the statistical methods to be applied to uh, analyze these data. We use traditional principal components analysis and uh, find uh, main PCs, uh, principal components to classify these metabolites into different 
uh, uh, different uh, pathways. So for example, the first PC1 is more clustered with the short and the medium chain ACU quarantines. And the PC2 has more uh, higher loading on the low, uh, long chain ACU quarantines and the different PCs represent maybe different high loads to different uh, metabolites. Actually, all these different metabolites of cluster represent different metabolic pathways. So for example, the median chain long chain ACE carnitine is more representing the fatty acids metabolism. And this branching amino acids metabolism also is very well known to indicate the metabolic, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So next, we can link to the uh, principal component score to the air pollution exposure and find the near roadway air pollution exposure related with the PC2 score, which represent a higher level of long chain ACE carnitine. And uh, afterwards, we can use those results and uh, help us to uh, make some hypothesis of the underlying disease mechanism, such as the air pollution exposure uh, might uh, activate the lipolysis and increase the glycerol uh, free fatty acids and uh, potentially actually perturb the mitochondrial function. So next is from the same study sample. Uh, it's another example for the untarget metabolomics. So for the entire metabolomics, so we come out can come out with a much higher uh, data dimension with t over 20,000 metabolomic features. Uh, among those 20,000 metabolomic features, we can identify maybe like over 400 metabolites uh, with different lipids, amino acids, different areas of the metabolomics, and we can also analyze the environmental chemicals such as the perforacial uh, chemicals, which is uh, well known to be endocrine disruptors. So this is just a uh, figure showing you the, the internal correlation of those chemicals, because uh, uh, a lot of time like people are exposed to in a chemical uh, mixture rather than just single chemicals in our normal life. So this is an example that how we analyze those chemical mixture for their relationship with different uh, disease outcomes. Uh, for example, here we have three PFAS chemicals and we want to understand what is the total effect of this chemical relationship with uh, a certain disease outcome. Here is a glucose trait. And the second is we want to understand among this mixture, which could, could be the most important detrimental component. So here we use a Bayesian kernel machine regression analysis method uh, to look for the chemical exposure mixture the response to the uh, outcome of traits. And uh, this figure, this figure just showing the totality, this mixture is uh, positive related with glucose traits. And uh, among these three chemicals, we can also find that it's a specific, this P4A chemical is driving the most uh, detrimental impact on the higher glucose level. Then second is like a, uh, we want to also link, understand the, the, how these chemicals can perturb the metabolism. Then we use the untarget metabolomics data. So this is a figure showing like a, if you're familiar with GWARS, this is the metabolome-wide association analysis. So each circle represents a metabolomic feature relationship with the chemical exposure. And we can look for the significance of these metabolomic feature and a, a focus on those significant signatures. Then we, we can combine these signatures information, use some pathway analysis results to further give us some of, uh, further give us some of the uh, metabolic pathways of how they can be related with the PFAS exposure. So from different samples, we can get different metabolic pathways and uh, the fundamental methods of uh, underlying the pathway method is, is, is actually just a Fisher's exact test comparing our significant signatures with the reference of metabolic pathway database, such as CAG pathways. And lastly, is that uh, further dig down into those metabolic pathways, we also want to understand what could be the specific metabolomic signatures that are play most important role in these pathways. So for example, here is another example using the a network analysis approach that we can uh, integrate the exposure here is P4A, PFOS, and PFH axis, and the metabolites represented by these triangles and the, 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 these uh, multiple met uh, metabolic outcomes, like glucose traits in those bars, 
uh, with these three layer integration of network analysis, we can find sub-modules integrate with different clusters of the exposure. For example, P4A exposure here related with the different amino acids uh, suggest to be unsaturated and uh, saturated long-chain fatty acids. It's also uh, related with uh, gl multiple glucose traits, including some like a 30 minutes glucose, glucose area and the curve. So we, from, from these things, we can, uh, results, we can also uh, make some conclusion like the chemical P4A is contribute, a most significant contributed to the glucose, impaired glucose metabolism, and also this regular lipid metabolism may play an important role here. So uh, next is uh, just a quick show off of another project, how we can uh, use the metabolomics data to integrate with other molecular data, such as gene expression data here in the IGIRA study, uh, where we interested to look for the air pollution perturbation on the molecular system and how it's related with the asthma uh, 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 exacerbation. So here is, an, again, another three layer of the integration with multiple air, uh, air pollution, um, uh, air pollutant chemicals, and also uh, represented by bar, and also the metabolites represent by those circles, and the triangles represent by the gene expression. So uh, uh, my postdoc, Jawan Nelly, uh, uh, is leading this analysis project right now, and hopefully you can find the uh, 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 genetic signaling pathways in also, as well as the metabolic pathways that are perturbed by these air pollution exposure represent different as, uh, asthmatic phenotypes. So lastly, I would like to introduce um, uh, our newly founded R1 project, uh, which will be continued for the next four years. It's a longitudinal study to look for gestational diabetes women. So we will uh, interest to uh, analyze the uh, positional organic pollutants that include 60 uh, chemicals uh, from different categories of these POPs uh, during pregnancy and the postpartum uh, of women and the following these women's longitudinally for, the, for their uh, diabetes risk. Uh, the diabetes risk can also be represented by a longitudinal trajectory of decline of uh, metabolic traits such as insulin sensitivity and the beta cell function. And the more interesting lay is that we're gonna use the archive samples to analyze the longitudinal metabolomic profiles uh, it's untargeted metabolomic profiles across these 12 years follow-up. So there will be a great challenge to uh, uh, use this data and uh, how to analyze these data with the longitudinal uh, high dimensional profile to build a trajectory underlying that these dynamic changes of metabolic pathways, how it's perturbed by the long-term uh, persistent organic pollutant exposure and how it's related with the disease risk of type 2 diabetes in these gestational women. So uh, about some future directions, as I already mentioned, the longitudinal metabolomic profiles is definitely a big challenge. There are some maybe potential ways, if such as the integrated network analysis may be helpful, but uh, it's, uh, it's not really a, a fully uh, understanding uh, area yet. Uh, a lot of methods need to be developed in this area. And the second, of course, is the integrated omics. I think uh, students and uh, our colleagues already heard a lot in the biostats division that we try to, uh, we have different data from projects with all these different layers of the omics. So uh, welcome the students to explore these uh, projects and uh, can help to develop new methods or apply novel methods to integrate these different areas of omics. And also, uh, Duncan, I think, led the uh, mediation analysis for the high dimension data, such as the metabolomics. We want to understand how these uh, uh, metabolo uh, met metabolic pathways is actually mediating the exposure and the disease outcomes. Also, how to address the causal uh, relationship between the me mechanism and disease outcome is another big challenge. So all these areas require a lot of novel methods and uh, I welcome students to contact me if you have interest and uh, have a lot of data and a chance to participate to these uh, great projects. So I will uh, end here. So some of my stu uh, current students and the postdoc uh, in my group um,
And if we have time, we I can show you maybe more of other studies. Thank you. Again, thank you very much. What an, a rich array of studies uh, and, and data. So I encourage the students to uh, pursue both Sandy and uh, Zhang Hua, uh, if you're interested in looking for projects. They've got more than enough to keep them busy. Any questions for Zhang Hua? Well, hearing none, uh, Dan, do you want to try uh, and see whether you can uh, make your hotspot work for, uh, for screen sharing? Now I see you're muted, and I'm trying to unmute you, but it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to let me do that. I'm muted still. Okay, no, we hear you now. Oh, okay. All right, I need to start. To, I I need to share a screen. Can I do that? Can you share my screen? Uh, my mouse is. I don't know how it's dead on arrival here. Let's yeah. See if I can turn it off and turn it back on again. Okay. I don't I certainly don't want to leave. Uh, share a screen. Here we go. Okay, so I'll share this one. All right, can you see my screen? It says you've start yes, we can. Amazing. All right, good. Okay. So I'll start the, uh, oh, let's see what happens, whether I can, ah, okay. All right, you're gonna see my sidebar. So I'm gonna talk about a project, single project called the Russian Health Studies Program. USC has a component, I'm the PI of that component. Um, what is the Russian Health Studies Project? Ah, I can't even, Okay, there we go. It's a US Department of Energy funded uh, program that focuses on exposures from the Mayak Production Association, which was an industrial complex that still exists. That was the first and largest producer of plutonium in the former Soviet Union. They don't make plutonium there anymore. At least uh, we think they don't. Occupational exposures to plutonium uh, and gamma rays began in the 19 around 1948 when they got their first um, uh, uh, when they made their first plutonium or, be, or built the plant to make the first plutonium and then there were exposures to village residents affected by releases into the Techa River from Mayak in the uh, 1950s. So Mayak's a big industrial complex. Uh, Techa River is a small river that goes through it and it was heavily contaminated in 19, somewhere around 1950. And then there's another group of exposed uh, individuals who were exposed to the East Urals radioactive trace, the EURT, which was an explosion that released a large amount of radiation from a waste containment vessel in 1957. So here's a picture of where we are. Can everyone see the map? Yeah. Um, this is where my mouse would be handy. Uh, if you look closely, you can see off to the west is Moscow. It's Moscow and, um, and uh, Mayak, well, the airport, nearest airport is the Chelyabinsk airport, is about a two hour flight um, from, so it's about a thousand miles, I, I presume, altogether. And uh, here's a close up view of the contamination. Down in the lower left corner is the Mayak plant. It's, I'm sorry that it's not marked, but it's the release point for these exposures. You know, you can see uh, uh, you can see the Techa River in blue, off to the little bit to the right, and uh, along the Techa River were about 41 different villages um, that were exposed. Uh, well, that you know where people lived that ended up, they used the river for lots of purposes and also just being near the river was, uh, was um, a source of exposure during the peak periods of contamination. And then this big plume 
of yellow and red, that's the EURT, which happened in 1957 and uh, spread radioactivity over uh, to the north and east of, um, of Mayak, basically in the Ural Mountain region. So reflecting these three uh, uh, exposures are, are three cohorts. There's the Mayak workers cohort, which was uh, has about 26,000 people in it. Um, there, they were exposed to gamma rays and to plutonium. Um, and then uh, there's the Techa River cohort, which is about 30,000 people. And uh, they were exposed to a number of radionuclides, both internal and external, mostly gamma rays, though. Um, and then uh, the third was the East Urals Radioactive Trace, the EURTC, about 22,000 people. And uh, it's they had similar exposure as to the TRDS, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Techa River exposures. So um, I'm going to skip this slide and, and go to more broadly. What is anyone interested? Why is anyone interested in these studies? Well, you know, radiation exposure is ubiquitous in modern society. There's occupational exposures in the nuclear facilities have certainly decreased since peaking in the 1960s, but medical exposures have gone up. So here's uh, another a, a, a pictogram. I hope it's uh, readable. Um, it shows that medical exposures basically have doubled from the 1980s to, to well, this is only up to 2006. And uh, with CAT scans and interventional fluoroscopy, that CAT scans are in green and the fluoroscopy is in, uh, in blue, representing a large part of the increase in dose. Um, but what are some of the scientific questions? A uh, continuing one is whether the same dose given over extended periods is less harmful than if given at once. So, you know, you, uh, the, uh, the question is, is prolongation. You know, if you give the same amount of dose chronically over a period of time, does that give the same risk of cancer? That's what we're mainly talking about here. Does that give the same risk of cancer as, as the same dose given at, over a short period of time? And for the, for the latter, the atomic bomb survivors study is the most informative about a single exposure to energetic photons. And whereas the Mayak workers cohort is the most informative about extended exposure to energetic photons, as well as to other types of radiation, including plutonium exposure. Um, and basically, if you look at the gamma risk estimates there, uh, it looks like the prolongation compared to the LSS, the prolongation is uh, about twice, about, uh, well, basically cuts the effective dose in half. And that's a dose rate effectiveness factor of about two. So you divide by the dose rate effectiveness factor to uh, look at prolonged exposures. So now I'm going to talk uh, about something a little bit different, which is going to Mars. And uh, so NASA actually determines allowable time in space. What I should say, once you leave, especially once you leave the Earth's magnetic field, there's a lot of radiation in, in outer space. There's a, uh, um, it's a big mix of things. Um, but uh, but uh, I'm going to ignore the complexities and focus on the simplicities here. Um, basically, NASA uh, calculates whether or not, uh, or calculates the allowable time and space based on estimated post-mission probability of radiation-associated cancer. And the, the limit is uh, determined by a dose uh, resulting in a 3% lifetime excess cancer risk at, a, at the upper 95% confidence interval. And sex-specific individualized risk estimates are based largely on the LSS, you know, the Japanese A-bomb survivors. And uh, this calculation, the initial calculation of NASA based on the initial models 
would have precluded women astronauts from going to Mars, but men could go. So, ooh, men, men could go and not women. Um, and uh, so, well, so what about these risk estimates? I mean, if you look at lung cancer in the LSS, it's kind of a funny picture. The risk estimates are high, uh, well, uh, high, to relatively high, especially for women. That would amount to a 26, per, these are excess relative risk estimates. So this is a 26% increase in the relative risk of, uh, of cancer. It needs to be translated to an absolute risk scale, but that's not too hard if you know the baseline risk in the unexposed. And, uh, but look at that upper confidence limit. You know, it goes up to 0.79 for women. I wish my mouse was, I could point, but I can't. Um, and then the MWC, uh, the risk estimate is considerably lower. It is strongly statistically significant. It has a much lower upper confidence limit. So, you know, suppose that we just switched, you know, and used the MWC. I mean, after all, this is chronic exposure and so is being in outer space for a year to get to, get to Mars and another year to get back, I guess, something like that. Uh, wouldn't that allow females to, or I should say women astronauts to, um, to go to? Well, there are other complicating factors and I've kind of alluded to one, um, uh, which is that the radiation fields are quite different, but also the NASA risk calculations did assume a DREF of 1.5 already compared to the, the the estimate of about, well, anyway, two for most cancers overall. So why are these studies interesting statistically? Well, uh, one thing about this is that if you're gonna get into this field, you can learn or you have the opportunity to learn a lot about risk modeling using very flexible Poisson regression techniques for uh, cohort survival analysis. And these are implemented in a package called Epicure. And gradually, maybe some of this will show up in R um, if possible. Uh, we're fitting uh, general risk models that go beyond proportional hazards as in standard Cox regression. And so familiarity with these techniques is a great tool to have in the toolbox. Uh, and then Another thing, that, and actually the thing that brought me into this project has to do with the uncertainty in doses. So dosimetry is vital for translating results from one population to another, you know, to get risk per unit dose. But, but doses are uncertain. The estimated dose from the MWC and TRC is provided by the dosimetry system that's being used as hundreds of realizations of possible true dose history. So rather than just one uh, dose, uh, one um, uh, dose history for the cohort, there's hundreds or even a th even more than a thousand in some cases. And uh, so the question is, how do we use all this information about dose uncertainty and risk estimation? Well. We've written three papers already uh, describing and implementing a GEE, a generalized estimating equations approach to using all the realizations. And this method, I think this method can be applied in air, some other kinds of studies too, like certain air pollution studies where multiple realizations are also provided. And, and we'd also like to consider something beyond just the GEE approach, try to do Monte Carlo maximum likelihood in some way, for example. And then uh, we're planning to do a simulation that would be done in R, presumably. But we can't do this without help from graduate students. And yes, funding is available. And I've listed just a few of the um, uh, of our collaborators in the US and in the uh, in Russia and and uh, and in Washington D.C., so uh, I guess 
I went through the talk with enough time to answer a few questions. Well, thanks again, Dan. Another rich uh, set of uh, studies. Incidentally, uh, just last night, I just started watching Netflix's Away, uh, which is about a mission to Mars, and it is commanded by a woman. I can't recommend the series, particularly it's pretty melodramatic, <laughs> silly, but uh, anyway, I guess Netflix, if you want to go to Mars, maybe you should contact Netflix. Yeah. I, I, I do want to thank, I, I really want to thank Dale Preston, of course, for, um, for his involvement. He's been involved in these studies um, for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, he, he does the majority of, he's, he, I think he's the reason why there are these cohort studies. Well, the cohort studies, the cohorts were defined um, back in the 1980s. He came to Russia, uh, well, first in 86, but he came to um, Mayak uh, in, in about the 1990 or so and uh, saw the potential for, um, or he came to uh, the Southern Urals Biophysics Institute, I should say. And th that's where our collaborator, some of our collaborators are. For those of you that don't know him, Dale Preston is a real giant in our field. Uh, a, uh, the senior statistician at the RERF in uh, Radiation Effects Research Foundation and Hiroshima for many years, and now, of course, in, uh, also involved in these Russian studies. Yeah, I, yeah. And a real fun guy. And uh, I don't know if he's on. I had given him the link to try to get in. I have not seen him on the list. OK. Although, uh, for our previous speakers, I had uh, passed on links to uh, a couple of students that have been I know, looking around for projects, and so I can do the same for you if you'd like. Yes, that would be good. Oh, uh, excuse me, can I ask a question? Go right ahead. Yes, yeah, so first of all, you talk about Mayak. Uh, uh, I think, is it is it a Christian disaster? Because I'm actually looking it up. Um, is it like a nuclear disaster back in the Soviet Union time? and? In, so basically, you guys want to study how is it uh, is the nuclear radiation affect um, people around this area? Well, the, I mean, the people with the highest exposure are the workers, and so yeah. just in the course of, I mean, they would work these guys till the, their lower their blood counts would start to drop, you know, and then they'd rest them for a while, and then they would go again. So in some cases, so the radiation doses in Russia are much larger than in other places. So, but I'm not aware, there were certainly accidents, you know, that would expose someone to very large doses also, but they, they were small accidents, not large. But the biggest accident was the EURT, which was, there was a reactor, uh, I'm sorry, a waste um, uh, container that was filled with uh, radionuclides and warmed up to the point that it, it chemically exploded and uh, blew stuff way up into the sky. Oh, I see. Uh, so, so you say like uh, this project has available funding, right? Because uh, currently I'm doing like teaching assistant, but like I'm also looking for a research. I'm having a little position. difficulty hearing you. I'm sorry. I, okay. I haven't. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I can speak louder. So currently I'm doing a teaching assistant, but like uh, I'm also interested in looking for a research assistantship for next semester. So I, I'm, uh, if you're interested, could we arrange a time to talk about this project a bit? Yes, sure. That would be great. Okay, I sent you an email. Okay. Okay, I'll wait for an email. Uh, can, uh... Can you compare the Mayak accident uh, with Chernobyl in terms of the magnitude of the releases? Um, Chernobyl is by far the largest uh, nuclear accident. Um, 
uh, and uh, and in terms of the amount of radiation that was dispersed, now it was dispersed over a very wide area, so um, the highest doses are nearby to the facility, but um, and then the second uh, sort of nuclear accident uh, in size is Fukushima, which was not nearly as big as Chernobyl. The third is is the EURT, uh, you know, accidental release of radionuclides into the environment. Now that one's mentioned uh, in some detail in the book on here on Chernobyl that I just finished reading, uh, Chernobyl. The well, the EURT was near, uh, Chernobyl is a long way away from uh, Mayak. It's about, it's in the, it's in the Ukraine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, simply just describing the past history leading up to that. Oh, I see. Yeah, no. It's, yeah, that's right. I okay. I read that book of uh, Midnight in, in Chernobyl in case, it's a new book in case uh, anybody's interested in these kinds of uh, stories. That's the one that was turned into a HBO series, I think, isn't it? Which was also excellent. Yes. <laughs> well, um, three, we're getting to the end of the hour. Uh, three great talks. Um, I hope uh, we will be hearing more from all three of you. Uh, I have an open invitation to you uh, and anybody else for that matter to give uh, full length talks uh, later on in the year. Any other uh, questions, comments before we uh, all sign off? Thank you for organizing. Well, thanks to yeah, the Thank you. Here. Bye all. Bye. Bye. Take care.